Hello and welcome to part 3 of my Blender Room tutorial. My name is Eve, I'm a 3D artist and illustrator and today I'll be guiding you through the process of making this room. In this part 3 of the video we'll add the materials to our models. I'll also show you how to light and render an image of the room. Big apologies for the delay in part 3 of the video but I've been very busy with some secret and not so secret projects behind the scenes. I'll share a bit more about that later. Now let's get started. What we'll do first is we'll add some materials to the objects in our scene. A material controls the object's color, reflectivity, metalness and other properties. We'll add a material for each distinctive color in our scene. Let's start with the dark purple color first. Select the tabletop. Then go here in material properties. Click on New. This creates a new material. Double click on it and name it Dark Purple Material. I just shortened material to MAT. Now click on the window next to base color. Then select the eyedropper tool and with it click on the table color on the reference image. Now the base color of this material is purple. Click on this button to enable material preview. Now you can see the properties of your material. Let's apply the same material to all the objects that are the same shade of purple in our scene. First let's do the table legs. Select each object, then go into material properties here. Then from this button, from the drop down, choose the dark purple material. Do that for all the purple objects that share the same color. Now let's add a material to the walls. Select the walls and go into material properties. Click on the minus here to remove the default material. After that click on new to create a new material. Call this new one mid purple material. Click on the box next to base color and then select the eyedropper tool. Click on the wall color on the reference. Nice, now the walls are a different shade of purple. Here, because we've modeled everything as one object, we'll have to apply different materials to the faces where we want to have a different color. Let me show you how to do that now. Let's add a dark purple to the side of the walls. Click on the plus sign here and add a new material slot to the object. After that, click on new to create a new material. Name the material. After that, click on the box next to base color and with the eyedropper tool, swatch the darker purple from the reference. Now let's apply the darker purple color to the sides. Select the walls object and press tab to go into edit mode. Press free for face selection. Shift select the faces on the side of the wall here. After that, click on the darker purple material to select it and then click assign here. That assigns the material only to the selected faces. As you can see now, the sides of the walls are darker. That's a nice trick to give your isometric room some depth. Next, let's do the color on the floor the exact same way. Click on the plus sign here to add another material slot to the object. After that, click on New to create a new material. Name it something like brown material. After that, click on the box next to base color and with the eyedropper tool, swatch the brown color from the reference. Next, select the walls object and press Tab to go into edit mode. Shift select the faces on the side of the floor here. After that, click on the dark brown material to select it. Then click Assign. That assigns the material to the selected faces. Now press Tab and go into Object Mode. Next let's assign a material to the floorboards. Select the floorboards object. In Material Properties, click on New to add a new material to them. 
name the material. Click on the box next to base color and then select the eyedropper tool. Click on the floorboard color on the reference. Nice, now the floorboards are a nice pinkish brown. Next we want to make the sides of the boards the same dark brown color that we used for the floor. This way we can easily see the gaps between the boards. Let's do that now. Select the floorboards object and press slash on your keyboard to isolate it. After that, press numpad 7 for top-down view. Press tab and go into edit mode. Press A to select all the faces. After that, turn on x-ray from up here. Now we're going to deselect only the top and bottom faces of the floorboards. We're going to deselect them because we want to have a selection of all the faces on the side so we can apply the dark brown material to them. So with all of the faces selected, hold down CTRL and drag select the top and bottom faces of each board. So you just drag in the middle here and that deselects the top and bottom. Leave the side selected. Nice, now we have what we want, only the side selected. Now click on the plus sign here to add a new material slot. From this button here, from the drop down list, choose the dark brown material we created earlier. After that, click on assign. That assigns the dark brown color to the sides of the boards. Now we can clearly see where each board ends. Next, I'm just making a new material for the lightest purple in the scene. I apply this material to the bed frame and the chair. I'm not doing anything special here, just the exact same steps that we did before. I also make one pink material for the bed covers and the rug. It's the same shade of pink, so they can share the material. Here on the rug, we want to add a little trim of purple on the outside. To be able to quickly do that without having to UV the object and paint on it, you can just cut in some edges at the ends here and then apply the purple material to the newly created faces. Let me show you how to do that now. Select the rug and press slash to isolate the object. After that, press tab and go into edit mode. Press Ctrl R and add some edge loops to each side like this. After that, press 3 for face selection. Shift select these faces. Now in Material Properties, click on the plus sign to add a new material slot to the rug. From the drop down, choose the mid purple material. With the faces still selected, click on the sign. That makes the corners purple like in the reference. Do the exact same for the sides of the rug. Select the faces on the side and then assign the mid purple material to them. Next, let's add the darkest purple material to the bookshelf. It's the color going around the bottom doors here. Select the bookshelf. Press tab and go into edit mode. Press free for face selection and shift select these faces here. After that, click on the plus sign to add a new material slot to the bookshelf. Then click on New to make a new material. Name the material. It is very important to name your material so you know what you're looking at. With the new material selected, click on the box next to base color and then select the eyedropper tool. Click on the dark purple color on the reference. After that, click Assign. That assigns the darkest purple color to the selected faces. 
Let's assign this dark color to the inside of the shelves as well. Shift select all the faces on the inside here. Then select the darkest purple material and click assign. Do the same for the other shelves as well. This will create some nice depth and will make your model look less flat. Before we continue, let me quickly show you how to make the colors in the viewport less washed out. To do that, go into Render Properties here. Scroll down and then go into Color Management. After that, change the view transform from filmic to standard. That now makes the colors in the viewport more vibrant and more true to the ones that we're swatching from the reference. I recommend using the standard mode in most cases. After this, I continue adding materials to the rest of my models. Here I add one material for all the paper that will have writing on it. I add a separate paper material to the paper that won't have any writing on it. I call the second material paper blank. So that is two separate paper materials. That will be important later because we will UV one set of models with one material and then the other material will be separate. After this I continue adding separate materials for each color in my scene. I reuse the materials for different objects that share color. I won't bore you with creating each individual material, but it's essentially the same steps I showed you before. For the spines of the books here, I add the blank paper material. Next, I shift select all of the books. I press slash to isolate the selection. I then press ctrl J to join all the books into one object. Then, while in edit mode, I shift select all of the faces for the pages on the books. After that, I go into material properties and click on the plus sign to add another material slot. Then, from this button, I select the blank paper material and click assign. I continue to do the exact same for all the objects in my scene. Here on the plant, I want the stems to be a different color from the leaves. The objects, however, have been combined into one by pressing Ctrl J. Let me just show you an easy way to select the separate parts of the objects without separating them. While in edit mode, select the face on the stem. After that, press L. That selects all the linked faces on the stem only. Now you can apply a separate material to the stem part. I apply a dark green material to it. I do the exact same steps on the other plant. I continue making my way through all the models the same way. Here on the chest, while in edit mode, I shift select all of the faces that are gold on the reference. Then I click on the plus sign to add a material slot to the object and choose the gold material I created earlier. Next, let me show you how to make an emissive material. That is a material that gives off some light. We'll do it for our potion here. Select the potion surface object. Then go into material properties and click on new. Name the new material blue emissive material so you know what it is. From the box next to base color, swatch the color of the potion from the reference. After that, scroll down here. Here we're going to change the emission color that will make the material emit light. Click on the box next to emission. Choose the eyedropper tool and then click on the color and the potion on the reference. Now the material will emit blue light. You can see what that looks like by clicking on this button here to display the render preview. Right now we're doing the rendering with Eevee. For this project however, we want to use Cycles as our render engine. 
that will give us more realistic results in lighting. To switch to Render Engine, go to Render Properties here. Then from Render Engine, switch it from Eevee to Cycles. Now our render will be a bit slower, but you can see that the emissive material already looks better. Now switch back to Material Preview from this button. Next, let's add a separate lighter blue emissive material to the potion bubbles. Select one of the bubbles. Go into Material Properties and click on New to create a new material. From Base Color, swatch the color of the bubbles from the reference. Then scroll down to Emission. Click on the color box next to it and swatch the color of the bubbles from the reference again. That will make the bubbles emissive. Now while in object mode, shift select all of the bubbles. Then press Ctrl J to join them into one object. That applies the material to all of the bubbles when you join them. If you go into render preview now, you can see that the bubbles have a nice soft glow to them. Next, let's add a pink emissive material to the Oracle Orb on the shelf. Select the sphere and in Material Properties, click on New to add a new material. Make the base color and the emission color purple. Nice, that's looking good. Next, let's select all the bottles and combine them into one object. To do that, while in object mode, shift select all of the bottles. After that, press Ctrl J to join them. Now let's apply a glass material to all of them. Go into material properties and click on new to add a new material. After that, click here next to surface and change it from principled BSDF to glass BSDF that applies a glass preset to our objects. From roughness here, you can change how rough the glass is. I set mine to 0.2. Now if you go into render preview, you can see that the bottles are now transparent and you can see the liquid inside of them. Next, let's add some color to the liquid inside of the potion bottles. Go back into Material Preview mode from this button. Select the bottles and press H to hide them. Here I've merged all of the liquids into one object by pressing Ctrl J. Start applying materials to the liquids. I apply one blue material to all of them and then I make the material slightly emissive so it has a nice glow. After that, I apply different materials to each color potion like we did with the other objects before. I do one material for each color of potion. Nice, now all the colors are applied. Let's see what that looks like in render mode. Okay, that looks good, the potions are all done. Next, let's add a separate material for the potion bottle caps. Select the bottles and press tab to go into edit mode. Press 3 for face selection. Turn on X-ray from up here. Shift select all of the faces for the bottle caps. Mm -hmm. 
With all of them selected, click on the plus sign to add a new material slot to the object. Then, from the drop down, find the brown material we used in the rest of our scene. Now, click assign. Do the exact same steps for the rest of the bottles. Great, the bottle materials are now done. One last thing I want to do here is to add some thickness to the glass. This way the bottles won't look too flat like they do currently. To add thickness, select the bottles and go into Modifier Properties here. From Add Modifier, add the Solidify Modifier. As you can see, that adds some nice thickness to the glass and it makes it look better. Next, I'm just coloring the bottom of the floor dark brown so it's not purple. Great, we're all done with the base materials now. Next up, we're going to make some UVs for the objects that need to be painted on. Let me quickly explain what UVs are first. So what we need to do in order to be able to paint on our model here is to make a UV map. A UV map is the flat representation of the surface of a 3D model and it's used to easily apply 2D textures to a 3D object. The process of creating a UV map is called UV unwrapping. In order to unwrap any model, we need to create UV seams. A seam tells Blender that when we unwrap, the faces on either side of the seam should not stick together in the UV map. So in a nutshell, UVs essentially flatten your model into 2D islands and they allow you to apply 2D textures to your 3D object. I'll show you the process now. What we need to UV in our scene here are the bed sheets and the papers. Those are the only objects in our scene that need a pattern or need to be painted on. So those are the only objects that we're going to UV. The rest of the objects will have their color controlled by the materials. Let's UV the bed sheets first. I'll explain as we go along. First, let's open the UV editor. Drag your mouse from this corner here to open a new window. Then, from this button, choose the UV Editor. Select the bed covers object and press Tab to go into Edit Mode. Press A to select all the faces on the object. Now, here on the right, you can see the object's UVs. The UVs are the flat representation of your 3D object. The ones we have on the right are not ideal, however. So let's do an automatic projection quickly to lay them out nicer. To do that, while you have all the faces selected, press U and choose Smart UV Project. After that, click OK. Now Blender automatically made and laid out the UVs for us on the right here. Smart UV Project is great for unwrapping simple objects. Now that your object has good UVs, you can either paint on it or you can apply a 2D pattern texture to it. I'll show you how to do both. First, I'll show you how to manually paint a pattern. Pull up the timeline a bit from down here. Then from this button, change it from Timeline to Shader Editor. Now you can see the material that is applied to the bed sheets. Make sure that this material is a separate one and isn't applied to any other objects. Now let's add an image texture to the material. Press Shift A and search for image texture. Click on image texture to add it. After that, click on New. Name your image texture and make the size 2048 by 2048 pixels. Change the color from black to white. After that, click OK. Connect the color of the image texture to the base color of the material. Your mesh should turn white. Now in the UV editor, from this button, choose the new image texture we just created. This way you can see what's happening in the UV editor while you paint on your model. 
After that, select the bed sheets and press tab to go into texture paint mode. Now let's make the overall color of the blanket purple. Press N to open up the tool menu from here. After that, press T and select the fill tool from this menu on the left. Then press S and click on the purple color on the bed covers in the reference. This swatches the purple color and saves it to the color palette menu down here. Click on the purple color to make it active. After that, with the fill tool active, click on the bed covers. That fills everything with purple. You might see some lines now where the UV seams are. To fix that, go into shader editor. Select the image texture we made earlier and then switch this here from linear to closest. That removes the white lines. Now we can start painting the stars on the bed covers. Press S to swatch the yellow color from the reference. After that, select the paintbrush from here. If you try to paint on your mesh now, you'll see that nothing happens. However, in the UV editor on the right here, something is happening. The reason for that is because the bed cover normals are facing the wrong way. That happened because my solidify modifier had a negative value on it. So that made the normals face the wrong way. It's an easy fix though, let me show you. What we need to do to fix this is to just flip the normals. To do that, select the covers and press tab to go into edit mode. Select all the faces by pressing A. After that, go into mesh, normals and choose flip. Now the normals are facing the correct way and you can now paint on top of your mesh. Press tab and go into texture paint mode. You can now start painting on your mesh. To speed up your painting process, you can paint with symmetry turned on. In order to have accurate symmetry, you need to have the origin in the center of the object. To place the origin in the center, right click, then go into Set Origin and choose Origin to Geometry. That moves the origin point to the center. Now press Tab and go into Texture Paint Mode. Scroll all the way down and from Symmetry you can now enable Symmetry in X. You can now start painting in some stars. After you're done painting the first two, you can just clone them so you don't have to keep redrawing them every time. To clone them, choose the clone tool from here. Control click on one of the stars. That sets the origin for the cloning tool. After that, press F to increase your brush size. Click on the mesh to clone the star. Nice, now you can do that a few more times all over the bed covers and you're done with painting. The second method I want to show you is just applying a pre-done seamless pattern to your mesh. I made this pattern in Photoshop and I've supplied the link to it below, so you can use it if you don't want to paint the texture by hand. Let me show you how to apply the pattern now. First, in the shader editor, I removed the image texture we created earlier. Now, drag and drop the pattern image into the shader editor. Connect the color of the new image to the base color of the bed cover material. As you can see, some of the stars are laid out weird and they're cut in half in places. This is because of how the UVs have been laid out by the smart UV project we did earlier. If we want more precise seams, we have to place those by hand and then re-unwrap our object. That will allow us to have more control over where the seams go instead of just using the seams that the Smart UV project did. Let's do that now. Select the covers and press Tab to go into Edit Mode. Press 2 for Edge Selection. Shift select these edges.
After that, right click and choose Mark Seam. Then shift select these edges as well. Right click again and choose Mark Seam. What this does is it will break the model into separate UV islands. Blender will separate these UV islands at the edges that we mark the seams. Let me show you. Select everything by pressing A. After that, press U and choose Unwrap. Now here on the right you can see our new UVs. All of these are separate islands that we separated by marking the edges as seams. Now we can adjust how the pattern looks on the mesh by adjusting the position of the UV islands. Let me show you how. Let's say here. We want to remove the stars from this top part on the bed covers. To do that, while in edit mode, press free for face selection. Select one of the faces of this UV island. After that, press L to select all linked faces. Now in the UV editor, you can manipulate the selected island. Press S to scale it down so it lays only on the purple. If you need to, you can press G as well to move it out of the way. You can do the same for the side bit. You can select the UV shell and then move it with G so the pattern lines up. Alternatively, if you don't want to line it up by hand, you can make it so the top and sides are part of one whole UV shell instead. That way the pattern will wrap around without manual adjusting. Let's do that instead. We'll just remove these seams to do that. Select these edges. After that, right click and choose clear seam. Do the same on the other side. After that, select everything by pressing A. Then press U and choose Unwrap again. As you can see, the pattern now wraps all the way around the top and the sides. And that is both ways you can do the pattern on the bed covers. I just wanted to show you both methods, which is hopefully useful for your future projects. Next, let's do the textures for the writing on the paper. As a reminder, all of these objects that we'll have writing on them should share the same material. This material is separate from the blank paper material. Now let's add an image texture to our material. Select one of the objects that has the material applied to it and then go into Shader Editor. Press Shift A and add an image texture. Now click on New. Make the new texture 24E8 by 24E8 pixels. Name the paper texture and change the color to white. Click OK. Now connect the color of the image texture to the base color of the material. From this button in the UV editor, choose the new paper texture we just created. Next, let's make UVs for the paper so we can actually paint on it. Shift select all of the paper objects that need to be painted. After that, press tab and go into edit mode. Press A to select all of the object's faces. After that, press U and choose Smart UV Project. Click OK. That automatically unwraps all of our objects. Here, we just want to make the UVs of the opened book a bit bigger. To do that, select a face on the open book. Then press L to select all the linked faces. Now you have the UVs highlighted in the UV editor on the right. Select them and press S to scale up the UVs. Scale them up so they fit inside a quarter of the space. Now let's quickly join our objects into one so we can paint on all of them at the same time. While in object mode, shift select all of the objects that will have the writing on them. After that, press Ctrl J to join them. To fix the normal issue that happened here, go into Object Data Properties. 
After that, go into Normals and enable Auto Smooth. Nice, now we can start painting on the papers. Press Tab and go into Texture Paint Mode. Select the Fill Tool and press S to swatch the color from the paper. After that, click on the objects to fill them in. Now we can scribble on some fake writing on the papers. Change the color to a dark brown color from the color wheel here. After that, select the paintbrush from here. Here you can change the size of the brush by pressing F. Then start scribbling in some squiggles to make it look like there's writing on the papers. Nice, that's looking good. You can repeat the same process to draw inside of the picture frame or add textures to any area that you want. Now let's save this texture so we don't lose our progress. In the UV editor, go to Image, Save As and save your texture to a file. I save mine as a PNG. Please make sure to do the step here because if you don't, you'll lose all of your texturing progress once you close Blender. Next, I'll show you how to set up the lighting in the scene. Before we proceed with that though, I just want to quickly explain why I've been a bit absent from YouTube recently. In the last few months, I've been very busy with some freelance work, which of course I'm very thankful for. But sadly, having all of that on meant that I wasn't able to dedicate as much time to YouTube as I wanted. In addition to that though, I have some exciting news. Behind the scenes, I've been working hard on making my very first Skillshare course. The course is now out and it shows you how to make a 3D character from start to finish in Blender. It's perfect for beginners, but more experienced users can also find a lot of value from it. If you don't have Skillshare, I have the course available on my Patreon as well. I'll leave links to both in the description if you want to check them out. So yeah, that's why I've been a bit absent from here, but it's all for a good reason. I'll still be making regular videos on here, on YouTube for free, but I also wanted to start making some more in-depth courses that will hopefully be even more helpful for people. Lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to all my patrons. They have supported me throughout the whole process and because of that I was able to create these tutorials and courses. If you enjoy my videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon if you can. Even if you can't, I still really appreciate you being here and watching. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Next up, we'll start lighting our scene. Click on this icon here to enable Render Preview. We currently only have one light in our scene. This one. This is just a default one that is in every scene. Let's delete that one now. Press delete to remove it. Now we'll add our own light sources. First we'll add a little plane behind the window which will emit a bit of light for an emissive shader. Press this button to go back into material preview. Let's add the window now. While in object mode, press shift A and add a cylinder. Press tab and go into edit mode. Turn on x-ray from up here. Select the bottom of the cylinder. Press X and choose Faces to delete the selected faces. Now we have just the top left. Press Tab and go into Object Mode. Press R, X and type in 90 to rotate the cylinder top. After that, scale it down with S and place it on the window with G. Let's quickly tidy our viewport windows here so we can clearly see what we're doing. Drag down the shader editor. After that, click between the viewport and the UV editor, choose Join Areas and drag click to the right. That removes the UV editor from the right. Next, let's apply an emissive material to the window cylinder. Go into Material Properties here. Click on New to add a new material. Name your material. After that, enable Render Preview from here. Scroll down on the material and set the transmission to 1. Set the alpha of the material to 0.5. That makes the object partially transparent. 
After that, change the emission to a white color. You can see that gives the window a white color and a nice glow on the side of the wall. Next, let's add a spotlight. This will be the harshest light that's coming through the window. Press Shift A and add a spotlight. Rotate it with R and position it behind the window here with G. Enable Render Preview again. Right now the light is too weak to be noticeable. Let's increase it. Select the light and go here into Object Data Properties. Then from Power, increase the power from 10 watts to 3000 watts. After that, increase the spot size to 55 from here. Change the color to a pale orange. That makes the light nice and warm like sunlight. Next, let's add a light to the side of our scene to fill in the shadows and make the lighting a bit more even. Press Shift A and add an area light. Position it on this side with G and rotate it with R so it's facing the inside of the room. If you turn on Render Preview now, you can see how it fills in the shadows nicely. If I hide the light, you can see the difference with and without it. Let's just increase the light power a little bit. In Power here, set it to around 30 watts. You can also increase the size of the light to 1.5 from here. This makes the surface area of the light a bit bigger. Nice, that's filled in those shadows nicely. I'm also making the color of the light a pale blue. Next up, I want to add an HDRI to our scene. An HDRI is a panoramic photo of sorts that stores loads of data in it. This data can then be used to create photoreal lighting and reflections in your scene. HDRIs are an easy way to get realistic lighting with very little effort. You can find lots of free HDRIs on polyhaven.com. This isn't sponsored or anything, but they just have one of the best free libraries out there. So I would definitely recommend them. I'll be using the Sunrise HDRI from their library to add to our scene. I'll leave a link to it in the description. You can download it in HDR or EXR format from here. I download an HDR and then go back to Blender. Here you want to pull up the shader editor. From here change it from object to world. Now drag and drop the HDRI you downloaded. Connect the color of the HDRI to the color of the background. For it to actually work we just need to add two more nodes. In the shader editor press Shift A. Add a Mapping node and a Texture Coordinates node. Now connect the generated output of the Texture Coordinates node to the Vector input of the Mapping node. After that, connect the Vector output of the Mapping node to the Vector input on the HDRI. Nice, now you have a working HDRI. Blender is now taking lighting information from it and lighting your scene with it. What you can also do from this mapping node here is you can rotate the HDRI in the X, Y and Z axis. That will change how your lighting looks. I leave my rotation on 000 by default. Here in this background node, from Strength, you can change how strong the effect of the HDRI is. I set mine to 0.3 so it's very subtle. Next, let's just remove the HDRI from the background so it's only used for lighting. We'll make the background transparent. To do that, go into Render Properties here. 
After that, scroll down to Film and then enable Transparent. That makes the background transparent, but the HDRI is still used to light the scene. If I unplug the HDRI from the shader editor, you can see the difference with and without it. And last but not least, let's add some volumetric fog to the scene so it's a bit more moody. Press Shift A and add a cube. Move the cube so it covers the whole scene. Add a new material to the cube from Material Properties and then name it. After that, in the shader editor, switch from World back to Object. With the new cube selected, in the shader editor, delete the principled BSDF node. After that, press Shift A and add a volumetric scatter node. Connect the volume output of the scatter node to the volume input on the material node. As you can see, that gives us some fog. Let's reduce the fog for now. To do that, reduce the density from here to about 0.03. Nice, that's much better now, it's much more subtle. You can see the difference with and without the fog when I hide the cube. It adds a bit more of an atmospheric feel to our scene. Next, let me show you how to set up your scene for rendering. Go into Render Properties here. For rendering, you want to make sure that you're using Cycles. You can use Eevee as well, which will be faster, but Cycles just produces better results. From Device, choose GPU Compute if you have that available. That will make your render faster. If not, you can leave it on CPU. What you can also do here is enable denoise in the viewport. This will give you a quick denoise so you can more clearly see what changes you're making in the viewport. It's very handy for prototyping things when you're moving lights and such so you can quickly see what changes you're making. So I recommend you make use of the denoise. After that, go here and render. Change the noise threshold to 0.1. You can also reduce the max samples here from 496 down to around 300. This will make your render faster. Make sure that denoise is enabled here as well so your final image is denoised. After that, go here into Output Properties. In Resolution is where you set the size you want your final image to be. I want mine to be square so I set it to 2048 by 2048 pixels. After that, here in Output, you can set the file extension of your rendered image. For this, we'll do a PNG. In color, make sure it's set to RGBA. That gives you transparency on your image. Now let's make a camera to render from. In the viewport, position your angle like this. After that, press Ctrl, Alt and Numpad 0 to make a camera from view. This is the camera we'll render from. And one last step, select this area like we made and just disable cast shadows from here. This ensures that there won't be multiple shadows from different light sources. Otherwise it could get a bit too messy. And now we're ready to render. Press F12 to render. It will take a little bit of time here. Once it's done, you can save your image from Image, Save As. In the end, you have a nicely rendered image like this one. And that is everything for this free part tutorial. I hope you learned something new and enjoyed the process. Also, if you have any questions, you can leave them below and I'll do my best to help. And last but not least, here I want to thank all my patrons who have supported me so much over the last few months. Thanks to all your support, I've been able to continue these tutorials and even create a course which has been a dream of mine for a very long time. If you enjoy my videos, please consider becoming a patron. I do lots of exclusive videos over there and I also share a behind the scenes of my animation project The Magical Adventures of Gizmo and Oz. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one!